Hello. Thank you. Some great talks so far. Words is a measure of hope. Um, Ezra Pound once said that uh, a man's hope measures his civilization. But how do you go about measuring hope? And since the conference theme is words, I thought we'd start there and see where that takes us. As you saw this morning uh, with Deb Roy's talk there, he's collected uh, six million words that his um, family has spoken. And that's amazing for a collection of spoken words. A collection of written words, we also have those. And these collections, were, they're called corpora, a corpus, body. We've actually got some of the biggest bodies around. The somewhat sinister sounding uh, linguistics data consortium actually has gigaword corpora. That is to say that they've collected texts which all together run in length over a billion words. And these are really useful. Deb Roy showed you some really interesting uses for them earlier. But we can also use them because linguists used to go around introspecting about grammar and saying, gee, Otto, do you think you can say, I wish I was, or do we have to say, I wish I were? And these days, we can actually just go to the corpora and see what people have been writing. So this is a query of the Google Books corpus uh, from 1800 to 2000 there. And you can see the frequency of those two phrases. And you can see that both of them have been relatively frequent over time. And we'll take that as evidence that both of them are grammatical. No need for navel gazing. The other neat thing here is the peak in wishing in 1900. And the linguist, Mark Lieberman at uh, University of Pennsylvania, he's written a lot on language log. He's wonderfully called this the great Victorian wistfulness bubble, which, which I really love there. We need to uh, think about hope, and my theme is hope. And so I thought I'd look at hope there in the Google Books corpus. And, and this is what I find for hope. Again, the frequency there. And it's not a very happy picture, is it? We've got this peak, the 1830s seem to be a very hopeful time, but we've lost hope over time. And you can see that drop here going into World War I, another one going into World War II. So are we losing hope? Well, we may be, but as the conference theme tells us, there's more than words. If you Google no word for hope, what you'll find is various claims that languages as diverse as Japanese and Korean, Abenaki, Kikapu, uh, Portuguese, Ukrainian, even the uh, Dom language of uh, Pau Pau New Guinea, that they all lack this word. And this is supposed to tell us something about these cultures, variously evincing their optimism or their pessimism, their stoicism or their joy, their wisdom or their folly. The problem with this is that it's all nonsense. The contradictory nature of these um, claims really makes a mockery of any kind of argument. And, you know, when you actually look at it, these languages don't lack for words for hope. I've asked native speakers of these languages, or people who study them, and they tell me that, for example, in the Japanese, we have the word kibo, which means hope, or the Ukrainian, nadja which means hope. So sometimes you can say hope in a single word. Other times it takes a little bit more than that. Andrew Pauly, an expert in a language family called Trans New Guinea, writes to tell me that many of the verbal expressions Kalam has for motions are not single words, but fixed phrases. It would be a mistake to equate vocabulary with individual words. A mistake indeed, but a common one. Now, what the writers of these articles, blogs, and uh, books that we Googled up here earlier, what they have in common is a belief in the power of words. Not in the sense of the pen is mightier than the sword kind of power of words, but in this single word fetish that Pauli warns us against. But more than that, they have this idea, common to a lot of people, that if a culture has a single word, not a phrase, but an individual word for a concept, then that must mean that concept is somehow important to that culture. And the flip side of this is, of course, that any culture lacking an individual word for a given concept evinces some sort of cultural deficit, a native neglect, a, a philosophical paucity, an absence, a dearth, a dereliction, a failing, an insufficiency. 
Now, with all these words for going without, what does that tell us about English culture? On the other hand, we've got just as many words to speak about plenty. So, it becomes very difficult to say that having a word for something actually tells you something meaningful about that culture. And with all these words to choose from, the pundits always seem to land on those words that really support their just-so stories, oh best beloved. Nothing is made of the fact that English has very mundane words like cuticle, or semitone, or hook, or that we lack translations for words such as mizu or oyu, the Japanese words meaning cold water and warm water, respectively. Actually, my wife is a native speaker of Japanese, and she finds it amusing when I mistakenly say mizu ga tsui, which means more or less the cold water is hot. This idea that words somehow tell us something about the culture is probably most famous here. This idea that Eskimos have hundreds of words for snow. And being here in Canada, I need to be careful. We tend to prefer the word Inuit, but uh, Eskimo actually uh, covers more than just the Inuit. There's also the Yupik in Alaska, and they're very happy to be called Eskimo. Uh, the other thing, I was talking to John Steckley earlier, and he was telling me about Eskimo, and we were discussing whether it actually means eater of raw fish or not. There seems to be some evidence against that, but John says he has evidence in Huron that says it definitely does mean eater of raw fish. But more to my point, the idea that English or that Eskimo has many, many words for snow is foolish. There's no evidence for that. They don't seem to have any more words than we do in English. So, that tells us that you've got to be careful what you count, and you've got to be careful how you count it, but also that counting words might be interesting, but it, we have to be careful about the conclusions that we draw from it. Now, with that warning in mind, I'd like to go back to some other languages and see what the frequency of their words for hope is. The Google Books Corpus has a number of different language sections. This is the Russian word, Nadezhda. By the way, I don't speak a lot of these languages in case my pronunciation doesn't show that off. But uh, remarkable similarity here, isn't it? That peak early and then that drop off in hope over time. This is the Spanish, Esperanza. And again, not quite the same drop, but a similar sort of pattern. So we've got three in a row, and now we want to say, hey, wait a minute, this means something. But if we keep going, we get the French, l'espoir. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along, move along. The German Hoffnung. Again, no interesting change. So, maybe we were a little too quick jumping to conclusions here. This is the simplified chi Chinese word, xiwang. It also means hope. But this obviously is not telling us something about the frequency of xiwang over time. There's something really strange going on with the data here. Now, this could be uh, a collection problem with the Google corpus, or it could have something to do with the simplification of the Chinese writing system, which happened in about the 1950s. I'm not sure what it tells us, but it's actually a good thing because it reminds us that these graphs are just shadows, hinting at some vague idea that we've called hope. There are many reasons to mistrust them, and there are many reasons to think that just counting words might not actually get us to the truth. Speaking of the truth, the Republicans south of the border, big champions of truth, they've got this meme where they like to count the first person singular pronouns. Those are words like I, me, my, uh, used by Barack Obama in his speeches. The idea being that the first black US president is somewhat full of himself. George Will at the Washington Post has uh, written about this a number of times. One example he has is he counts 70 first-person singular pronouns in the 89 sentences spoken by Barack and Michelle Obama in their presentation to the Olympic Committee supporting Chicago's ultimately failed bid. The problem here is that Will offers us a count, but no comparators. Seven out of 89 sentences. Is that a lot? It's hard to know. So Mark Lieberman decided that he would compare a number of um, press conferences by these presidents and uh, the last three presidents, and see who used the, first, the most first-person singular pronouns. So, who do you think it was? George Bush in a knockout. 
most first-person singular pronouns, and Obama had the least. So, obviously, comparators are important, but we can't just go comparing anything willy-nilly. Cosma Shalizi at the University of Michigan has this wonderful analogy where he talks about comparing the or calculating the heights of buildings using their shadows. And if you measure all the shadows at the same time of day, you'll find that gives you a very good idea about the heights of the buildings. But if you measure the shadows over the course of a day or the course of a year as the sun moves around overhead, that tells you nothing interesting about the change in the height of the buildings. What does it mean if the frequency of the word hope is dropping over time? It might be meaningful. On the other hand, it might not. Maybe we need to dig into the word a little bit more and find out what's happening. Now, we can go back to the corpora. John Firth, a linguist, has said, you shall know a word by the company that it keeps. So, what company does hope keep? I went to the corpus of current American English, and I looked for the verbs that came directly before hope most frequently. And you can see them in order there. I hope they're not too small. At the top, we've got lose, lose hope. So maybe it's not such a bad thing if we're not talking about hope anymore, if all we do is complain about having lost it. But if you dig into the data, and this allows you to do that, what you find is not just people saying, I've lost hope, but people saying, don't lose hope, or we can't lose hope, or we shall never lose hope. The other words here, give, offer, bring, restore, and find, if there's a pattern, some kind of metaphor, it's that hope is a gift. It's a treasure. It's something that we bring to people to bring them happiness. Or that hope is a fuel. It, when we see emptiness, we use it to replenish and move forward. And that touches on another fundamental human metaphor, this idea that forward is good. Unfortunately, practically speaking, forward isn't always good. There are barriers, traps, and indeed despair. And so in bringing hope to people, in bringing happiness, we hope, um, we can try to do that, but sometimes our efforts might actually cause damage. Uh, you can imagine an uninformed doctor in the, in the past who may have actually killed his patients trying to help them, or the introduction of a new species into an ecosystem in the hope that it will somehow help the ecosystem, and yet it destroys it. So a gift is not always a treasure. But what of hope, good or bad? Well, it seems certainly linked to happy thoughts. And Dan Gilbert, this uh, a psychologist who has done a lot to advance our understanding of happiness, says that he always linked these two. But he also says we were wrong. People who are here and now seem happier than those who are not. So maybe hope takes us out of the here and now and makes us less happy. Or maybe hope brings individual happiness, but that happiness makes us complacent and leads to societal decline. There's so many ways to look at this, and by now, you're saying, Brett, stop vacillating. You're worse than Hamlet. Come on, make up your mind. But that's the point. We look at this data, and we make up our minds too quickly, and I think we have to be careful about that. Now, somebody who cannot be accused of having done that is Humber's own Wendy O'Brien, and she's thought a lot about hope, and she's written chapters and uh, papers about it, and she reminds us that the difference between optimism and hope, where optimism is some sort of happy, future, vague feeling, but hope, she says, grounds us. It compels us to action and to beginnings. And this is why, again, she says, people like James Abrinsky of Médecins Sans Frontières can say honestly that he is hopeful, but not optimistic. These are arguments about the way people use hope, and I find Wendy's arguments to be very compelling but I think there's lots more to learn about hope, and I think the corpora can really help us do that. But as my time is at an end, I'd like to leave you with just one more graph here, something to think about. And it brings me back to the idea that if hope is one measure of our civilization, then surely another is need. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.